What's up, everybody? I'm Lawson. And I'm Tim. And welcome to the Hookblade Podcast After Hours. I'm your host, which I've already told you that my name is Lawson. And with me, as always, <laughs> is another host who's already told you that his name is Tim. Welcome to the very first episode of the Hookblade After Hours. Tim, why is it called After Hours? Uh, it's, you know, well, or- <laughs> originally... No. Okay. Unfortunately, that's the wrong answer. Um, so after hours, <laughs> we decided we wanted to have an opportunity because we, we really enjoy podcasting and sharing our thoughts with you every week uh, about Assassin's Creed stuff. But we also wanted to talk about things that had nothing to do with Assassin's Creed. And we realized that the best way to go about doing that, at least for now, is to do it in a separate little tidy little spinoff bonus extra additional podcast for your listening pleasure. Well, I was just going to say that that was going to be my second answer. <laughs> the standard document book made. There's two parts. A hook. And the brand. Um... <laughs> Um, <laughs> we're drunk. We're, we're 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 kind of drunk. No, we're you know we're buzz. We're tipsy. Buzz. We're tipsy. We are a couple of legal drinking age adults drinking adult beverages for adults, and potentially that changes the the vibe of this podcast. But maybe maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, we're gonna have to. Well, I mean, this is like the patient zero. We're gonna we're gonna find out with this one. You guys could either be like, "Hell yeah, buzzed Lawson and Tim," or you could be like, <laughs> "Be like, this was literally no different." Tim laughed his ass off like a like an idiot, and Lawson said, "Did a did a bad impression of somebody," and it's like any other episode that you've ever done. Hey, hey, most of your impressions are pretty good. Some of them are pretty. Some of them are pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I knew I was buzzed because fun fact: the closet in which I record all of these episodes has a big old mirror on the other end of it. And I was literally just sitting here waiting for Tim to be ready to record, making weird faces at myself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that I thought you were gonna say that you were like blushing. But <laughs> no. That's not what happened. I was just staring at myself making weird faces for like 20 minutes. What are you drinking, Timothy? Um, okay, so I was just telling you before we started, um, I've got a vodka and Sunny D because I don't want to have to pay for regular orange juice. It's like a screwdriver for poor people. It just tastes like regular <laughs> orange juice. Who the who cares? You know, like <laughs> it, it's basic. It's just it's it, okay. You know how YooHoo is chocolate drink, Sunny D is orange drink. It's not you know chocolate milk or orange juice. It's just orange drink. Orange drink. Anyway. That's that's what YooHoo is. Yeah. YooHoo is a is chocolate drink. Both of them are artificial flavors plus sugar equals fun. Pretty much, they should make an alcoholic YooHoo. Dude, yes. Is there at least alcoholic tra- chocolate milk? Yeah, yeah. I well, when I worked when I worked at Tibby's, we had like an adult chocolate milk drink. So it's definitely it definitely exists. That sounds awesome. If it's not sold places, you can at least make it. It's like you know you just. I don't know what alcohol goes well with Pour milk, a little though. absinthe in your chocolate milk. And what do you so what do you what do you got, Lawson? What are you drinking? I'm drinking truly lemonades. These things have changed my life. They're really, really good. I had them for the first time when we were at your house. That was That's right. That's right. Truly lemonades I highly recommend because unlike all the other hard seltzers, they actually taste more like a lemonade carbonated drink than like a seltzer. Like it's the only one I've had that doesn't just taste like water with a little extra spice right white claw tastes like that what you're describing white claw uh, yeah white like claw that. i can i can get down with a white claw they call me white clawson for a reason but it it is not as enjoyable as just having something that tastes like lemonade with carbonation and also only about a gram of sugar that's what i'm really looking for so i'm looking for a sugar-free alcohol experience and i did not want to go through the effort of like mixing vodka and diet seven up or whatever mm. <laughs> We're here to yeah, talk what? about the boys. We're here to talk about a show on Amazon Prime called 
The Boys. And the reason we're, we're the talking boys. about it. Talking about The Boys. We're a couple of boys talking about The Boys. And Tim, how'd you, like, how'd you feel in uh, like a sentence about season one of The Boys? Um, I thought season one of The Boys was pretty great. A lot of fun satirical comments and a lot All of like, cool the, and interesting direction. That was where but ultimately losing it fell flat at the end. The- interesting. Yeah. And it fell flat because why? It ended well, in a very My tropey. original... Like I, I kind of, I, I felt like it lost all of its momentum. It felt like it was building up to this grand finale, and the last three episodes were me. kind pilot, of a dud though, to me. And I know I you also can't just felt judge like, the whole show on the pilot, but the pilot is still one of the best pilots I've ever seen. One of the best pilots I've ever seen, one hundred percent. Overall, great show. Uh, but yeah, it definitely fell flat towards the end, which isn't the case for season two. I didn't even have to ask. I was going to say, how did season two compare? So, okay, do you think season two is better than season one? Uh, yes, one hundred percent. Okay, I. Agree. Um, I agree. obviously I thought it was one of the best pilots I've ever seen, and I was really I had like low expectations for the show because when I saw all the commercials and trailers and advertising for it, I was like, "Oh boy, someone's got a dark take on superheroes." How fucking original! Because <laughs> I mean, even the main blockbuster superhero movies have kind of been selling themselves for like a decade plus on being a dark take on superheroes like it's a dime a dozen really like you can go see fucking bright burn they made that movie for 12 cents and it's a dark take on superheroes have you like, have you seen that movie no dude it fucking sucked <laughs> i saw it in theaters really oh man because produced I, by the visionary director behind guardians of the galaxy that's dude they fucking they fucking tricked me dude they got me in the theater because of that <laughs> and it turned out to be directed by his brother or written by his brother i'm not there for i'm not there for jimothy gunn i'm there for james <laughs> jimothy gunn it was pretty ridiculous uh and it's kind of funny because like the dark superhero universe that they tried to set up at the end of that movie like the boys is doing it better so yeah <laughs> well what's so great about the boys is that it's dark in a very realistic way it's not just like what if what if Superman was kind of a complicated guy? It's like, yeah, it's like, sure. hey, if if superheroes actually existed, what would happen? Uh, late stage capitalism would happen and there would be a huge fucking corporation with no accountability and it would be a hugely dominating media presence. These would be celebrities. There'd be all kinds of corruption behind the scenes. And these superheroes, with the amount of power that they would have, would not be likely to be the greatest and most moral people on the earth, which is certainly a probably sadly true statement, I think. If we actually just went back 100 years in our history and dropped some some Compound V, some superheroes, into our, into our country, uh, the odds that right now in 2020... Things would look much different than they do in the boys, I think, are pretty slim. Let's go ahead right now and say, full spoiler warning, we're going to talk. I mean, we're too, we're not sober enough to to not spoil the show. <laughs> so if you haven't watched the boys season one or season two, you, you, should pro- you probably should. But honestly, we recommend it. it. We'll probably say right up front anytime we do this show, like... Should you actually go watch the thing we're talking about? And the answer in this case is a resounding yes, I'm sure, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's a good show. It's one of the it's one of the better shows on TV right now, I'd say. It's probably I, I think The Boys season two has a pretty good shot at being my favorite like season of television of the year, which there's a lot of competition for. It's crazy because you often see like the second season of a show get like a facelift on certain things, but Season two is better than season one in almost every way. Yeah. And it's crazy, but it's not different. Like there are some shows, no. like some of my favorites, like, okay, Fargo and the leftovers, both are examples where I'd say season two is better than season one, but neither of them, but, but both of them are like the season two is completely different from season one. This is a, a scenario where season two is exemplifying all of the ideals and like and and it's hitting all of the targets that season one had. It's doing the same things. It has the same goals, but it's just doing it better. Yeah, it's de- yeah, it's it's definitely like just ten xing it, right? Like it's yeah. not it's not reworking the formula of the show. It's doing everything the same. It's yeah. just that all of the boys are all much more interesting <laughs> and have more things to do. And, and the and girls, there are girls in the boys. There are girls, and some of the boys are I in can- some of the girls. But. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but like 
If you would have told me at the beginning of this season that I was going to like Frenchie as a character, I would have been skeptical. <laughs> but I, I end up, I end up liking him. Mother's Milk. He's the best. He's, he's still the best, the best ever. Yeah. All the characters are really likable and really interesting, except for the ones that are evil. But honestly, even the ones that are evil are so much fun to watch. I just love watching Homelander. Homelander is like American Psycho levels are just like fun to watch the psychopath. Like, you know how some shows you're worried about, like, oh, if there's a character who's really fun to watch, but you almost don't want them to take up too much time. Like, oh, if they overdid it on this character, it'd be like Urkel in Family Matters and they just overdo it and mm-hmm. lose interest. I think Homelander is like one of the rare cases where like you could put Homelander on screen for every second of screen time in an episode and I'd be completely on board all the way through and I'd never get tired of him. He's just yeah. incredibly fucking watchable. I will say about being tired of though, Huey really did not have much to do in the beginning of this season. Yeah, I think that they're kind of in the process of figuring out what to do with Huey and One of the things I have to give them credit for is that at the end of the season, they've kind of set up an interesting place for Huey to be in for season three. Oh, yeah, for sure. hundred percent. I think (laughs) I I think it's almost certain, though, that like, okay, well, you and I have discussed this. You and I agree that there'll be a time jump. I think there'll be a time jump of at least four years or more. No. And I definitely think that season three is going to start out with Starlight and Huey married or about to be married. Uh, mm. That seems like a no-brainer to me. No. Nah. Four years is a big jump, dude. Yeah, but that's also necessary. Like that, 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 That's enough time for all the characters to have had a little bit of normalcy and some peace. No, it's more time than they need for that. I think they could do like a year and get away with that. I feel like it gives Huey enough time to be working on a campaign and then like every all, all these characters and also it, it helps that Homelander's son what will be a teenager by that point. Nah, and so nah. all of them have had it's this time happen that way to be a part, to be a part and to develop separately. I just, I, I mean, I'm not like settled on four years specifically. I think more or maybe a little less would be, be okay. But I think everything that they would accomplish in a time jump, they could just as easily accomplish, except for the idea that you've mentioned of having Homelander's son become a teenager could be accomplished by the natural year that will be in between them by virtue of them coming out a year apart. That said, obviously, like if the show's goal is to accelerate the timeline of the whole storyline with Homelander's son, then a, a time jump will be in order of some kind and B now would be the best time for it because everything's pretty much settled one of the strengths of the season two finale compared to at least season one is that everything wraps up really nicely there are definitely a couple of dangling threads which you always want on a tv show that's ongoing and those threads are promising you have the whole setup for victoria newman you still have the church doing their shit there's a lot of stuff going on but so like if they were ever going to do a time jump now would be the time so i agree with you insofar as that much is true but at the same time i don't think it's absolutely like a foregone conclusion that we're going to see a big time jump. I think they could just go forward a year and everything would be okay. I, well, I, and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree that like any amount of time jump is still, is still like, I obviously I think it, we both agree a time jump probably will happen. Uh, if you're counting the passage of time being a year between seasons as a time jump, then I agree. But if that does not count as a time jump, then I disagree with you. It's, it's not going to start. And it's like the next day after the, after the, the, collectives no fate ahead that is that is okay that's a good point because the end of season one they could have just picked up season two and been like it's the next day but they didn't they gave it like a a a good amount of breathing room the reason another reason why i think that there will be a time jump of that magnitude is because i think it'll it'll be more impactful if we have like an episode or two of the characters having kind of separated themselves from the fight like like you said things have wrapped up pretty neatly in season Mm -hmm. two and so it gives plenty of time for homelander to have been brewing on something it gives plenty of time for for uh vought have had some time for the dust to settle on this stuff right and it gives time for the uh, stormfront to be rebuilt and to come back which and that's interesting on the stormfront thing because while they don't like show her fully fully being dead for presumably that reason of being able to revive her down the line. I would guess if I had to, that like, I think it's very possible, very possible 
that she never comes back. Like, I think it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that she gets revived, but I think if she is going to get revived, it'll be after season three. I think what I see happening the most is that we were following Homelander. He flies out to some random Vought facility and there's Stormfront in a, in like in a fucking bathtub getting like rebuilt and her skin getting, you want you know, like all that shit. And he's yeah. like, he's still kind of romantically invested in her and he's manipulating her and whatever. Like, I feel like that is like at the end of episode one, they could show Homelander flying off to go see a recovering Stormfront. Because and they could also do that at the end of episode eight of season three, and it could just be a tease for future seasons. Like there's it's like an evergreen option that they can just do whenever they want to. Sure. Yeah, I I don't disagree with you there. I I just don't think that she's never coming back. I think she'll come out. I think she'll come back next season if in a limited capacity. But I guess it just, there's, there's something about the four plus year time jump that I feel like would give everything enough time. Like if all of a sudden. Four years is a lot of time, dude. If, if like, a, if, okay, if it's like a year later and Huey's like already being thrusted back into the, the fight against Vought and whatnot, I feel like it's too little of time for Vought to be risking that kind of exposure. Like things are, all eyes are on Vought right now. I feel like giving that amount of time period would give them plenty of time to plot and to realize what the best strategy is to start experimenting with Compound V again, if they even do that. I disagree, but it's such a minor thing. I don't want to spend the time arguing about it. I don't think it's like a bad opinion, as many of your other opinions are. <laughs> <laughs> I just disagree with you. I, I I don't think that'll happen. I made some, I made some pretty good calls, uh, if you recall, about season two. If you think back to like, as we were watching those first few episodes, I made some predictions that I was mostly right about. I mean, the difficulty with like home Homelander didn't quite turn on Stormfront. He actually kind of did the opposite. Homelander yeah. kind of like defended Stormfront almost. He from, did from Homie. I thought that yeah, and like I I was right that Stormfront would die at the end of the season, but I was completely wrong about how and why it would happen. I definitely thought that like she would see the Homelander's son as a threat to her control over Homelander. And that she would attack the kid or maybe even kill the kid. I thought it was possible she would kill the kid and that then Homelander would turn on her and kill her. I think that I, I mean, I'm definitely glad that it didn't turn out that way because one thing I was questioning, I wasn't sure whether it was going to be set in stone that like, you know, the kid is this really, really important through line for the entire series or is the kid a subplot for a season because it could have gone either way. And I'm not familiar with the source material or the comics at all. I don't know if a Homelander child spawn offspring comes into play in that story at all. But I did get the impression at the end of season one, when the kid was introduced, that he was being groomed to be the counterpoint to Homelander, the like contingency plan for Vought, that this would be a kid powerful enough and moral enough to kill Homelander if the need be. And season two definitely confirmed that that's Vought's intention. So I think now that maybe is the end point. That's the long-term goal of the show. It's at a certain point, you know, in season five or six or whenever they decide to end this thing, like what it's going to be is the son of Homelander killing Homelander eventually. I think they're definitely going to have a battle next season. Homelander's kid and Homelander. They're going to fight no, next season. It's too early. It's too early for that. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. I think if it's if it's next season, then okay. If we charitably assume that they're going to wrap this shit up in season five or six or whatever, like, are you going to have three seasons of them being against each other? No, that wouldn't really work. I think that eventually the kid will have to be on the side of the boys and they've already planted the seeds for that by having something of an interesting little dynamic now between butcher and the kid like butcher is going to have to kind of take the kid under his wing and be like to put butcher who's ostensibly a protagonist of the show into the most uncomfortable situation possible for butcher it would be having to kind of raise a kid and Beyond that, a kid with superpowers. Who does he hate more than people with superpowers? Like, that's already well established. But ultimately, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, as you might think, for instance, 
that the kid has to be a whole hell of a lot older than he currently is in order to, to go toe to toe with Homelander. There's no way that he could fight Homelander when he's a year older than he is now. Like he has to be like a teenager having worked on his powers. Mm, I don't know. I with, think that they've been vague enough about what the actual extent of his powers is that he could totally do that. Well, I also think that for he years, just like literally thought about how much he hated Stormfront, who's literally existed for a hundred plus years now, and he just blew her up with his mind. Okay, like, and Stormfront is clearly powerful enough to go toe to toe with Homelander. I don't know. I don't know if that's true though. I think I think Homelander may have not been giving his full strength in that like sex scene. You know. Like, I mean, I feel like sure. He could have killed her. I'm sure he could have killed her, but I bet she could have put up a fight. Well, all I'm saying is, if it's four years or, or more, and he's a teenager now, he's been working on his powers. Butcher has been, like you said, Butcher has been visiting him annually, teaching him things, try like and coming around they to the idea. That in the show. You can't, you can't just set it a year later, and Butcher is totally awesome with. The kid. It no, was because that's, later. that's the story that they're going to tell going forward is him getting to that point. I think what we're going to see is like in season five or six or whatever, that natural trans, you know, progression of time, a year, two years, three years to get to that point, e even more because we know this show takes a long time to make. By that time, the kid will be a teenager and will kill Homelander. That's my prediction. I would put money on it. I don't think that has to happen next season. I think our main disagreement is that I don't know if the show is going to run five or six seasons. That's why I, I think I'm also more convinced. I totally think it will. I think a show, like, okay, consider that season two doubled the viewership of season one. It is a, it is like as successful as a streaming show that isn't done by Netflix can possibly be. It's, it's the only show that isn't by Netflix that's like cracked the top 10 of streaming viewership. It's literally going to be Amazon's golden egg for like the next few years. There's no doubt. So the idea that it's not going to get exactly as many seasons as Eric Kripke and Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg wanted to have, it's going to have whatever number of seasons they want to make. And considering how much those creators get paid for a show of this level, I think it, it probably is a foregone conclusion. I'm going to say like betting right now, at least five seasons. If they if they end it after season four, you win the bet. But like, I think they'll go at least five. I think they could go as many as seven. I don't think they'll go past seven, but I think they could go to seven. I guess we'll we'll find out when season three starts how extensive this time jump will be. Yeah, and we'll see what gets greenlit as of season three, and you know, and we, and we can kind of gauge. Do you have any complaints about season two? I felt like the first couple episodes really relied on like the just random acts of just like absurdity, vi gore, violent stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. Like, isn't that shocking? Her head exploded out of nowhere. Like, that's just not a very They're good driving a tension. boat through a whale. Everything that I had a problem with on season one was fixed in season two. There were some episodes that have really stuck with me even now of season two. Yeah. Was it like four or five? I think four that was the kind of uh, very character driven episode where there wasn't a whole lot of plot going on. You were just spending a lot of time with like Huey and Mother's Milk and they were talking about his OCD. And yep. Yeah. Four. Four is my favorite. Something that's really funny to me is the like the very ridiculous almost product placement in the series in the season specifically. I mean, the Fresca gag is hilarious. I love Fresca. Fresca is a great drink, but I was really waiting for because they called so much attention to, you know, want a Fresca that like certainly at some point the, the Fresca was going to be poisoned. And then I read an interview. Apparently they were just like, what do cult members? What, what would they drink? And then someone just wasn't like Fresca. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, obviously, of course, it's Fresca. Let's give them all Fresca. I thought Fresca was just kind of like 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 a it was like mind control. That's what I thought it was at first. Like it turns out, I think the idea is that there's nothing special about it. They just really like Fresca. Yeah, I I just I thought the reason why like Juan Carlo Esposito re re refused it was because he he knows that it's like a mind control agent, and he was like, no thanks, I don't want it. I think they could do that in a future season, but I I I think they'll just I think they appreciate the humor of the idea that. 
cult believers just drink Fresca. No, I think so too. Also, on that note, I think the Deep is one of the more like understated comedic actors in the show. He is so funny. He's really funny. And I had a lot of complicated feelings about him in season one because I felt like on some level when he got sexually assaulted, it was very much played for laughs. And I wasn't sure also necessarily if it was really a great move to have this character who, you know, in the opening episodes of the show is committing sexual assault pretty blatantly to then have him be like almost a sympathetic character. It was like, I wonder if that's really what what we need right now. But but I think season two kind of because it's he's not really I mean, he's sympathetic, but he's more pathetic than he is sympathetic. And he's much more consistently played for laughs and constantly being duped. And I feel like season two made a lot of what happened to him and about him in season one retroactively more okay with me because it solidified the idea that this character is designed to be a laughing stock and he will probably always in this show be a laughing stock and that may just be the most appropriate thing to do with him and that just makes a lot of sense to me i just think he he, he gives like in that like really weird like commercial he was like dude that's not okay like his delivery, he's it's just so understated and so yeah, fucking Chase Crawford funny and so deadpan. It's it's so great. Like he's played totally straight. Yeah, I was watching this. Like you know, they were reading like Amazon reviews. It was like from season one, and that actor, like he's totally deadpan the whole time. Like he's he's really committed to it. And I thought that the deep might become like an antagonistic figure, but it's he totally isn't. I guess. Unless they're trying to fool us, but so far he definitely. I think isn't. he's going to stay firmly in the in the present material of he's going to be kind of a joke, and like next season they'll figure out something funny to do with him that's like just him being led down another path of ridiculousness, like they did in the season. Right. But eventually he'll be. I think he'll be redeemed eventually. I think they've made him so sympathetic and almost endearing in a strange way that we aren't going to want to see him be villainous like if he just went back to Vought as he really wants to do and he went back to the seven and then he just helped homelander commit whatever evil he wanted to commit like we would just we would we would kind of hate to see that because he has the chance to like you know do better it could be really interesting in broad strokes a lot of the progress that they're going to make on this show is going to be kind of one by one how many prominent powerful superheroes can the boys flip onto their side like already a train has helped them out mave has kind of supported them as well lamplighter obviously previous member of the seven ends up teaming up with them the question is like how many of them are going to stay loyal to the end and how many of them are going to switch sides and how's that fight eventually going to play out i kind of feel like if, if huey wasn't quick enough to get the fuck out of there like lamplighter would have just let huey get killed like he wouldn't he didn't care like can I also just say that Lamplighter's couple episodes, like his arc was a standout part of the season for me. I really liked it. I can see that. I just feel like, I feel like he was on the path to like becoming like likable and redeemable. And then the next episode, he's just like, yeah, I'm watching porn in the middle of the day. I don't know. It just was kind of weird. Like he went from being really ashamed of himself to like, yeah, I'm, I'm watching porn in the middle of the day. Fuck you, Huey. I don't care. Like, it, it kind of seemed like he would have wanted to help Huey because he didn't just want to commit suicide in front of the statue. He wanted to, like, actually do admit, make a difference and help someone. And I would have appreciated if he sacrificed himself instead of just killing himself in the middle of the hall. Yeah, I get that. And also, I think it's important to note that Eric Kripke, the showrunner of The Boys, has pointed out that, like, one of his regrets with season two is killing Lamplighter because he felt like with the actor, with Sean Ashmore, the character kind of came into its own and like could have had more to do and more to say in the story at large than just a two episode arc. Right. And that he could have left him alive and, and kept him around in an interesting way. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I that could have been better, but this is how it ended up. And I get him killing himself. I get him being guilty. I get him being regretful. And I get him watching porn in the middle of the day. That wasn't really crossing any lines for me. Uh, not that I have really ever watched porn in a context that I wasn't masturbating. This is after hours, so I guess it's fine to say that. I think if you watch porn, 
if you watch porn recreationally, but you're not actually beating off while you watch it, you're probably kind of a psychopath, right? Can we just get that out there? Is that is that universal fact or is that just my opinion? No, I think so. I, I, I don't think there's any reason to watch porn recreationally. If you're popping a DVD in the living room and it's pornography, whether you're by yourself, I mean, look, if you're watching it with friends, like to have a laugh, like, ha ha ha, we're watching porn now. I guess that's moderately defensible. But if you're by yourself watching porn and you're not masturbating, there is something deeply wrong with you. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I, or unless, I mean, I don't know. I, Especially I, if it's all porn parodies of your former colleagues at your job, which may be specific to Lamplighter in this case. But. Yeah, it would have been cool because I feel like, I mean, maybe not, but I feel like that actor is kind of, is probably not that easy to get. And it would have been cool if they could have used him for more episodes. I would have liked that. But. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's very final. You literally watch him burn to death. So there's no way he's ever coming back. But. And get his hand ripped off. Yeah. But I mean, good job, Sean Ashmore. You were a good couple episode character. The thing this season did that I appreciated was I, I always thought to myself, like, okay, why is Homelander bothering with all of this garbage? Why doesn't he just dictate the world and take over? And like, why doesn't he do that? And this season kind of answered yeah. that question as that Helmlander's most like sacred thing, the thing he values the most, is people cheering his name and people loving him. And he knows, probably, that if he just went around and killed the United Nations and killed the president of the United States and killed everyone that was a leader and just took over the world, that people wouldn't be shouting his name in love. They'd be shouting it in fear. You're 100 percent right. And so I think that's why Homelander restrains himself sometimes. And that's why he doesn't kill Maeve because he knows that if he does, this thing's going to be leaked and it doesn't matter because his lives, his what's most important to him is going to be over. So killing Butcher, not most important to him. I do think it could be alleged that Butcher has plot armor. I'm definitely of the opinion. This is my goofy fan theory, but I'm going to state it for the record right now so that if it does come true that this is the case, I can cite this as uh, as evidence in my favor. Um, I think Butcher has a superpower and that his superpower is persuasion because all throughout season one and two, he is constantly having conversations with people where he tells them what he wants and, and what he wants them to do. And they end up being convinced. And it's not always super clear that it's really that convincing an argument he's making. And oftentimes it saves his life and it pretty much happens at least every other episode. So I think it could be revealed that like, Butcher had some compound V action, and now he can pretty much get anyone to do what he wants, but he limits it to things he can at least convey in conversation, or it is limited that way. Like, if that became an, a plot element, it would be a little goofy, but I think it's very possible and consistent with how the show's written. You can also just make the argument that he has plot armor because he's the main character. But also, though, in that scene with Homelander, Homelander was about to kill him until may have showed up. Um, but no, 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 I, I'm not discrediting that. I do think that, I mean, that's an interesting theory. Like I've, I've always thought that like someone in the boys had a, had a power that, that they were keeping secret. I feel like I've heard at some point in the comics that the boys end up with power somehow, but I do think that having them convince people with powers to actually support their cause and therefore use their powers against the system is going to be a much more compelling TV show. I did not expect us to get two seasons in fully before ever learning why he's called Mother's Milk. I know. I kind of don't want them to say anything about it now. Maybe they should just ignore it for the entirety of the show. You mentioned this at the beginning. I, I think it's spot on that, like, this is this is some of the best, like, satirical, like, real-world representation of superheroes. It's it's yeah. it's it's some of the best, and there there's some eye rolly stuff. There's some on the nose things, but I do think that it definitely picks at a lot of things that are very common in media and just culture and whatnot. And what's interesting is not only though is it that like superheroes themselves are commercialized. It's not like superheroes just just exist. We know that Compound V made them. So yeah. it's kind of like Compound V was the catalyst for being able to commercialize like these superheroes. So it's not even that superheroes were like won over by corporations. It, like they were literally created by the corporations 
to be the servants of the corporations. Yeah, this is certainly not like a particularly insightful thing to say about this. I it's 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 there in the <laughs> it's it's there in the text. It's just interesting yeah. to me because in the first season you you just kind of assume like oh well superheroes exist no but they are actually superheroes are a product that was that was manufactured you know yeah. and next season we're gonna get all kinds of backstory about what the first superheroes in America actually looked like they've cast uh, Jensen Ackles as Soldier Boy who I suppose in the comics is like the first superhero kind of the Captain America analog in that universe and that'll be really interesting to see play out and that I think is actually how you'll be right about the idea of Stormfront appearing in the next season I think they'll get Aya Cash back and they'll have her exist in these flashbacks with as Soldier Liberty. Boy as Liberty or whomever she was in those in those times because Liberty I know she was using that mantle in the 70s but I don't know what she was doing in the 40s or whatever was she like a, a woman who was experimented on, I think, with Compound V like, as one of the earliest experiments, and that's why she's immortal? I think that's probably what it is. I think they said that, so we'll see some of that. Anyway, all in all, man, if you could rate season two of The Boys out of 10, what would you rate it? I'd, I'd give it an 8.5. 8.5? Yeah, I'd, I'd also give it an 8.5. I would. And I think wow. the first season I'd give like a 7.7 7 or like an 8, but this is an 8.5. And I think it can get even better from here. Can you pinpoint a favorite episode? I said, uh, so just reiterate, yeah. episode four is probably my favorite. So I don't know what you, you said. You said four. I think mine was five. Whichever one has the tentacle dong. I think it's number five. I think it's number five. I felt like while four definitely hit a lot of really interesting character development beats, five also hit some of those really interesting beats i think by focusing mainly on frenchy but it also had lots of really cool action and shocking violence and therefore to me encapsulated more of what i'm expecting when i watch the boys all in all i'm i'm really looking forward to season three i hope that season three is is what season two was to season one like i i just hope it doesn't lose steam i hope that they can prioritize like the quality over quantity here and yeah they're already doing a, a cynical, bizarre spinoff set yeah, in college. Fuck off, We're going to see how that shit turns fuck out, off. dude. I think it could be good. Like, uh, apparently the G-Men story in the comics that they're kind of in, taking inspiration from is pretty interesting. But we'll have to just reserve judgment on that for when it comes out. I definitely think a season three is not superfluous. Like, I think a season three makes sense. So um, we'll just have to wait and see whenever this pops out. And... We'll have to see if anything that we said in this episode uh, rings true. Yeah, 100%. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. This is our first sort of experimental after hours episode. Tell us in the comments, like, for those of you who are subscribed to us and you listen to us talk about Assassin's Creed every week, are you interested in hearing what we have to say about things that are not Assassin's Creed? Uh, you know, hopefully you are, if not, we understand and we don't ever have to do this again. We probably will not do this every week. We'll just do this when there's something we want to talk about. That's not Assassin's Creed related. I'm already kind of getting the impression. I'd like to talk about Watch Dogs Legion at some point. If Tim wants to hear my thoughts on that, we'll see how that goes. But we love pop culture. We love all things to do with movies, TV shows, music, and video games. And we've loved talking about Assassin's Creed for you guys. And I've had a great time this episode getting a little buzzed and talking about the boys. How about you, Tim? Yeah, the uh, <laughs> the uh, the buzz is kind of wearing off a little bit. I don't know. Me it's too. Not. Me too. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But yeah, <laughs> I've, had a, I've had a great time. I, I definitely I definitely hope that our our listeners enjoy this because I enjoyed doing it. I enjoy doing it as well. Just tell us what you think. And if you hate this, you can tell us. If you love it, you can please tell us. Um, <laughs> <'cause we wanna laughs> <continue. laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint. I didn't do any bad impressions of people this time. <laughs> can you do can you do a Homelander impression? Can you do that? No, but I can do a Billy Butcher. Do it. Well, Say well, well, for like the invisible cunt. <laughs> All right, Huey, let's take a step the fuck back. <laughs> what you're going to do, I'm going to get you to put this Charger C4 right up his asshole. <laughs> Dude, Carl Urban is the best. He's the best. He's Dude, the best. I will watch anything with Carl Urban. 
All right, guys, I've been Lawson. I've been Tim. And this has been the Hook Blade After Hours. And we might see you next week. That's, you know, a possibility. But we'll definitely see you on Thursday talking about Assassin's Creed to some extent in some way. Whatever the fuck we do. I don't know, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Peace out.